Tapio uh, got his PhD in 2001 from Princeton, and uh, he's pretty much been at Caltech ever since then. He is a professor of environmental science and engineering, and he's also a senior research scientist at JPL. He leads the Caltech Climate Dynamics Group, and um, when I was I was looking at uh, Tapio's website. He has a lot of really nice videos on there. And he also has some blog ent entries, which are very interesting, especially to people like me who are not really up on, on some of this more recent work. He has one video that I highly recommend. It's entitled Clouds, Clouds and Climate Tipping Points. That's a video he made about three years ago. I re really recommend that. Uh, that, that video has a lot of stuff in it on the role of changing CO2 on stratocumulus clouds. Anyway, the title of Tapio's talk is Lessons from Arakawa Infusing Theory, Data, and Computing. Thanks, Wayne, and um, thank you for Dave and everyone else who organized this. I think this, is, this has been really interesting for me and especially yesterday getting to know Akira Arakawa in ways I did not get a chance to know him. I met him, um, we've had conversations briefly. Um, I think between his shyness and my shyness and intimidation there wasn't a whole lot of an exchange but I really enjoyed the few hours we had together. But what I've always enjoyed and admired is his work that I'm familiar with and his approach to science, I think, is exemplary and should be exemplary for all of us still today. And I want to make the case why and how. Um, let me maybe dive right in. Um, Akio Arakawa, of course, was part of the what we call the Charney Report, the first climate assessment, um, where people looked at multi-model ensembles, you know, three models at the time of uh, climate change predictions and we're coming, trying to come up with ways of um, saying what CO2 will do to climate. And this has been cited many times. The estimate for the surface warming was somewhere between two and three and a half degrees, which was arranged given both by models and by some thumb factors of what people thought uncertainties are. That part is well known. I think what, what is interesting about the report is how carefully it takes it considers the science, and this is already in the summary statement, this rate reflects both the uncertainties in physical understanding and inaccuracy arising from the need to reduce the mathematical problem to one that can be handled by even the fastest available co computers. I mean, that same sentence you could still write today in about any climate assessment, word by word. Of course, here we are today. This is climate sensitivity in, in the CMIP-6 models. The range is from 2 to now almost 6 degrees. So there are some models that, are, that have a higher climate sensitivity than before. Um, many don't consider the very hot models realistic and that they, they don't reproduce some aspects of the past climate well, well. But that's not what I want to talk about. I think the key thing here is that the uncertainties are still large and the uncertainties all have to do with the types of problems that our cover has, has worked on as small-scale processes and primarily clouds. Um, clouds dominate the uncertainties. We cannot resolve them. Dave, Dave Randall talked about this yesterday a bit, and maybe I want to dwell a bit on the computational challenges and what you can and can't compute, because I think there's a lot of statements out there that are um, somewhere between confusing to misleading. Um, the low clouds that at least until recently dominated the uncertainties and probably still do. So clouds like off the coast here, stratocumulus clouds that, that Wayne has worked on and nice mixed layer models as well. Um, they have dynamical scales in, on, of the order of meters, maybe tens of meters. And we are getting to global models and resolutions at tens of kilometers that become routine and we can press this towards kilometers and shorter runs um, already. But that's still somewhere three orders of magnitude or so in length removed from what you really need to resolve the low clouds. And of course, that doesn't get you to the microphysics. Um, Dave mentioned since his time as a grad student, computing power, I think you said, has increased by factor 10 to 11. 
Um, so this is computing power increase since the time of the Charney report, it's 1979. It's not quite 10, 10 to 11 since then, uh, it's maybe 10 to the 9 or so. Point is, computing power has increased exponentially, it's on a log scale, and, and keeps doubling, which is really amazing, uh, given that Moore's law is predicted to reach an end, and our scaling has reached an end, and yet computer power keeps doubling. This graph isn't quite up to date, I need to update it, it's five years old by now, but it's, it still holds. But the interesting piece that you can add to it is this. So here are all climate models published from 1979 until 2017, atmosphere models, atmosphere-ocean models, or system models. Um, and what is plotted is their horizontal resolution on the left axis on a log scale, so it's inverse kilometer is horizontal resolution in the atmosphere. And the left axis is plotted such that the factor 10 increase on the left corresponds exactly to the factor 10 to the 4 on the right, because if you would want to increase resolution isotropically by factor 10, in a 3D fluid dynamical model, you need 10 to 4 times as many floating point operations. And you see that the models follow a shallower line than the computer performance because their complexity has increased. We've gone from atmosphere model to atmosphere ocean model to our system models, learned about in the new process and the like. So in, in many ways, that was a good evolution. Had we used all marginal increase in compute to increase the resolution of atmosphere models, they should have lined up with a blue line, and well, they didn't. So we started out, you know, Dave was talking about 400 kilometer models or close to 1,000 kilometer resolution in the 70s. So that's a Charney report and now we are tens of kilometers. But had we used all available extra computing power to increase the resolution of atmosphere models, we could already be at higher resolution. And for good reasons we didn't do this. But suppose from now on you do this. So from now on, enough complexity, we just only add resolution to the atmosphere and the ocean. And then in principle, we could follow this blue line, provided this exponential growth keeps going, which it, it can forever. But let's suppose for the sake of argument, it will for a while. Then you can ask, well, when will we resolve what? They've talked about the gray zone for deep convection. We are reaching this now, tens of kilometers, 10 kilometer resolution going towards kilometers. But the low clouds, the dynamical scales, tens of meters aren't even on this graph. If you just extrapolate it out exponentially, which is completely unreasonable, we wouldn't resolve this before 2060. So kilometer scale models are useful, and I think it's something we should strive to build. But there is no reasonable hope that just kilometer scale resolution in itself will resolve the uncertainties we have in climate predictions. You'll get climate predictions that are more detailed, Rainfall predictions that are more detailed, but they can be just as wrong as what we have right now. You still have a double ITCZ, for example, in many high-resolution simulations. So what has changed since Arakawa's work in the 70s on developing numerical methods, on developing um, with Wayne the, the cumulus prioritization that many of us use and love? It's really quite staggering to think about the changes. Um, so computing power since 1979 has increased by, by more than a factor 10 to the 9. And if you go back a bit more, you get to, to the 10 to 11 that, that Dave was mentioning. Dave was mentioning Akira Akawa doesn't really have papers where he compared simulations with observations in much detail. That, that may be true, but I think probably the reason is there just wasn't that much data. And it's... Even when I was in grad school, when I wanted to look at data, I, I found Bram Ord who gave me a tape where there was gridded data on a 10 by 73 grid on the atmospheric circulation that I used, but that was 20 years after this, and even then it was quite difficult to work with data. Um, I was trying to estimate how much data there was in, say, 1970s, and I'm not quite sure. I know right now we're getting around 50 terabyte of data just from NASA satellites alone per day. And you know, it's pretty reasonable to think that there wasn't more than kilobyte per day, radio sounds and the like. So it's pretty also something like a factor 10 to the 9 increase in the data volume, if, if not perhaps more. I'm not quite sure. So by some metric, you would think we are, you know, a billion times better than what, what people did in the 70s. And of course, in many ways, we are not, certainly not in terms of climate model um, reliability. And I, I would say a key reason is that on the theory side, there has been a lot of progress. But if you look at the derivation in Arakawa Schubert, and we heard about the 150 equations yesterday, you go through the first 74 of them, they still 
feel very modern, and I want to argue why. I mean, the key thing here is that, well, maybe in terms of communicating the end result, you could have done this in a shorter paper. I don't know. <clears throat> but what is nice about the work is that there is a controlled set of approximations that that Akira Kava and Rachel went through to get to the result. And laying out what that controlled set of approximation was, it just takes some space. And now if you want to do better, you can just go back and um, I would argue right now you should stop at Brandt equation 57, I looked it up yesterday, um, and move on from there. But that part is still, is still useful. I mean, here's, here's just the equation for um, a thermodynamic variable and sigma is the, the area fraction. And for example, there is a, a time dependence in it, a memory term that we heard about yesterday and the like. Those equations are still good. Uh, in, in essence, those equations are still what we use, and I'll show you how. It's just some later approximations you maybe want to generalize. So <clears throat> computing alone is not going to solve the issues we have in climate modeling. And the dynamical scales are that I mentioned are one reason, but even if you could resolve all the dynamics um, of clouds, microphysics remain, and there's just no way to bridge the scales in microphysics by brute force computing that we would need to bridge to get from all these small scale microphysical processes in clouds, um, warm rain processes, ice phase processes, mixed phase clouds are a big issue for the latest climate simulations. There's no way to get from there to what we need, macroscopic effects like albedo, precipitation, and the like, by brute force computing. You can compute what's happening on microphysical scales and clouds uh, very accurately in domains the size of cubic centimeters. It's from there to the globe, it's a long way. So. Computing alone is not going to, to do this. I, I think we need more theory, not less, to make progress here. And of course, it's not just theory. It's not just you know, paper and pencil while the trash can is on fire. But you need to combine that with, with what you can do computationally and, and what we can do, do with data now, given how much we have. We have amazing data. Um, for example, we have cloud radar, cloud lighter, observations of clouds from space. For not all that long yet, this is just a bit over a decade of data, but for, first day, for the first time we have 3D data, 4D data on, on global cloud cover. And we don't use those data much in climate modeling. As there is the expression, they drop to the ground. Um, they're there, we use them for model evaluation, but directly to inform a model, we don't use them very much. Of course, the other data we have that we're using a bit more is computationally generated data. This may be one of the simulations, uh, visualizations that Wayne was talking about. It was, this was made by Kyle Pressel. Um, this is a large eddy simulation, of course, on a C grid. What else do you do? There are other things to do now, but this is what we did. It's uh, learning from Arakawa how to discretize. And these, these simulations are very good in that we can compare them with aircraft data. In this particular case, this is a Caribbean cumulus um, situation. Blue is rain. And they're quantitatively quite accurate. There are microphysics, of course, are parameterized. Microphysics are uncertain. Microphysics still play a role, for example, in controlling how much it rains in these simulations, quite sensitively so. But the dynamics of these simulations are well resolved. Just price to pay is that the domain is small. This is. Uh, a few kilometers on the site. We can go towards tens of kilometers on the site, um, perhaps 100 kilometers on the site, but that's, that's about as big as you can make these simulations now. And to get to 100 kilometers on the site, you need hundreds of petaflops, so big computers. Um, computing alone is not going to solve the problems, and then the next, the next thing that's being talked about a lot is, well, there's there's these simulations we can do, we have data. Can machine learning solve the problem? Um, I think it's, it's part of a mix, but in itself it can't solve the problem either. Because what we want in climate models are models that, well, A, are useful for science. I mean, all of us do this because we want to make scientific progress, ultimately understand how ice ages come about and the like. So you want models that, that you can interpret just for scientific reasons alone. but more importantly, perhaps, ultimately what we do is for the benefit of society, we are funded by, by 
public funders in one form or another and have a responsibility to deliver things that are useful for the rest of society. And what is crucial there is that people can trust a model and unlike in weather forecasting in a climate context, we don't have the daily verification or falsification of what we do. So you need the model to be interpretable that people can take it apart beginning to the end and understand what's going on in there. So interpretability is important. Machine learning methods are not easily interpretable often. You need models that generalize out of sample and that's perhaps the most crucial piece. We have data now, we need to predict the climate that none of us have seen and that can be quite different for, for my children's generation. Don't have data for it, so we need methods that generalize to a climate for which we have no observed analog. And again, for practical applications, which um, you know, didn't play much of a role in the 70s, but I, I think now are crucial for what we do. Uncertainty quantification, likewise, is, is important. You need not just point estimates, you know, this is the mean change in sea level or sea ice cover, or whatever you take, but you want to, to come equipped with uncertainties because if, as you plan, you want probabilities of, say, storm surges exceeding a certain level. So I think these are three crucial requirements, and um, deep learning is not doing well with satisfying these requirements, or deep learning as practiced so far is not doing well in satisfying the requirements. Here's one example, I think a very good and useful study of Pierre Gentin and a number of other people. Uh, they took um, the super parameterized cam on the right, so it's, uh, it's cam with high resolution simulations embedded in each, each grid cell. Um, that gives you high resolution convection simulations and the top is the heating rate, the bottom is the moistening rate. And what you get from that are input output pairs of convection. So you get temperature, humidity in a column in, temperature tendency, humidity tendency in the column out. And you can use standard supervised learning approaches that require labeled input output pairs to train, in this case, a neural network, it's on the left, on these input output pairs of state in, tendency out, and it reproduces the, this mapping from states to tendencies very well. Um, it's, uh, left and right columns agree quite well. This works, but it has several problems. So this, this was on, um, it, the models involved here involve more than a million parameters. This is good to know that with a million parameters you can parameterize convection but it's hard to interpret. It doesn't generalize very well out of the training sample and uncertainty quantification is essentially impossible. Um, I think it's a, it's, it's a useful exercise and approach but I don't think this is the way forward. Now, if you think about what Arakawa has been doing, it, it, it was reductionist science and I, I loved Wayne's stories of watching the cumulus clouds of the oceans and outcome the cartoons and in the, in the later papers of how a cumulus cloud penetrates through the boundary layer and outcome from that 150 equations that try to describe that, right? Um, it's very much a reductionist approach. You take, you take the big picture and try to reduce it to something small that you can cast into equations. And the paradigmatic type of science, reductionist science, would be Newton, right? The, universal law of um, gravitation. It's a one parameter law with a few variables that generalizes from planets orbiting st stars to apples falling off trees. It's extremely interpretable. Yes, there's spooky action at a distance, but you can interpret it. And it it's lends itself very well to uncertainty quantification. Um, it, it's also useful to keep in mind what Newton replaced, right? This reductionist science started with Bacon, Newton, late in the 17th century. Before Newton, we had Tycho Brahe. He was the big data guy and in diligently compiling observations of planets orbiting stars. Um, those observations were used to inform the deep learning model of the time, Ptolemy's epicycles. So you used circles as basis functions to describe planetary motion. And you can describe anything with overlays of circles, and Ptolemy's epicycles did it. If there's just something funny happening, you just add another basis function, another layer in the network of basis functions, and you, you fit planetary motion extremely well. Price to pay is it needs excessively many parameters. So some circles going right way, some circles going left way, and various other parameters you need to fit. 
And right now, people perhaps laugh about it, but I think Ptolemy is where we are with deep learning right now. Well, Ptolemy was replaced by Kepler first, who replaced the basis function, the circle, by an elliptical basis function, and things got much simpler. So right now, we're trying to use um, things like value connects, I mean, basically nonlinear, strongly nonlinear sigmoidal functions as basis functions to fit everything. And it works great where you have lots of data. I would say in science, what we need is some Newton-like reduction to the right set of basis functions and, and smaller set of parameters. Of course, you know, the reductionist approach to clouds, Arakawa made more progress than, than anyone, really. Um, but a lot of us have tried to come up with the perfect reductionist description of clouds. Dave Randall spent decades on it and ended up writing papers on how to end the, the deadlock and the cumulus prioritization situation, realizing this, this reaches its limits, right? I mean, the systems are complex enough that you know, paper and, and pencil, trash can or not, you, you just are no, not going to solve that problem entirely this way. Deep learning success, by contrast, it, it, it rests on over parameterization, if you want to put it in one word, which means you're going to a regime where the number of parameters you're estimating is very large, um, larger than the sample size, typically. It requires very data-hungry methods, but leads to very expressive models. You can fit anything with it. They're universal approximation theorems. But generalizability, interpretability, and UQ are really challenging. So what, what I would argue and what we are doing is try to combine both the best of reductionist science theory with what you can learn from data science methods. Um, and what it requires, I think, is progress along three fronts. Advancing theory remains absolutely essential. And I want to give some examples of what we are doing there. And I have to say the last few years that we have been pursuing these approaches, if there's one thing that has surprised me day to day more than anything is the power of theory and being careful and derivations in leading to models that are very predictive. Um, I'll show some example. We want to use data, the data we have, that's observational data, and it's computa computationally generated data, and I'll show some how. And of course, computing power is still increasing exponentially. It's really amazing. One thing it means we should go to as high resolution as we feasibly can. I don't know what that means in practice. I'm trying to figure it out. I mean, the going to one kilometer, is the throughput is too slow. It's probably not useful. But there's, there's somewhere a sweet spot where you get a good compromise between using models for science, having reasonable throughput and reasonable accuracy, and I don't think we know where that lies right now. The other way of using computing power is to generate, for example, data about clouds computationally, and that lends itself extremely well to computing with accelerators and GPUs because it's a natively distributed problem. So how does it actually work? Um, it, when I started working in this area, I took some inspiration from the moritz Zwanzig formalism from statistical mechanics. And I don't want to go through what this is, but I just want to illustrate what the result of it is. So if you have a dynamical system, like here, is a variable x and a variable y, and let's say x is a slow variable and y is a fast variable, and they each have their forcings, fx and fy, and they're coupled through these coupling terms, psi. If you homogenize over the fast modes, um, or the small scales, however you want to view it, so the clouds, you can do this accurately. Um, and it's a bit involved. But what comes out is, in the end, an equation that looks like the equation at the bottom, an equation for the slow modes. And the crucial thing here is this. It still has the forcing for the slow modes, the fx. Then there's an m term. That's what comes out of the psi. So it's a renormalized version of the coupling. But crucially, there is noise, stochastic noise. And there is memory that also they've talked about yesterday. Um, the memory appears here as a convolution integral. So h is a memory kernel. And there is some convolve over some memory kernel over some time scale tau. That's one way of writing it. An alternative way of writing the same thing, and instead of having integral differential equations, is to write it as a separate differential equation with its own time dependence for the memory. So I think that's important to keep in mind when you average over a system that has no scale separation here. That's, there's no scale separation built in. If scale separation and time becomes large, 
we can neglect noise and memory and the like, but we don't have that, especially as we go to 10 kilometer or so resolution and climate models. Um, cumulus convection is no longer separated in scales from the resolved scales. You need to end up with parameterization and have these, these types of elements. Um, and you can do that. So we started working with Zhao, who is here, and I think we'll talk about some related approaches later, a good number of years ago. What Pierre Schibisma and, and Zhao and a few colleagues at the time at ECMWF pioneered is what they call the eddy diffusion mass flux approach. The idea is that you take the flow in, in a grid box and decompose it into coherent parts and more isotropic parts. Coherent parts are updrafts, downdrafts, and the like, and the more isotropic parts is the whole turbulence around it. You can decompose the flow and you can conditionally average over the two pieces. And then what you get are exchange terms between these different parts of the flow, it's orange arrows indicating those entrainment, detrainment that were already in Arakawa and Schubert. So in, in, in a bit more detail, this is, this is literally, you take Arakawa and Schubert and you, you more or less stop at equation 57 and then take a, take a detour from there. Um, you, you take the equations and you average over coherent and incoherent, more isotropically turbulent parts. And you take the Navier-Stokes equations, you get a bunch of equations, including for higher moments, for turbulent kinetic energy, for scalar variances and the like. I'm just showing two for, for illustration, the continuity equation and some equation for some scalar phi, where the scalar can be a thermodynamic variable, specific humidity, or can even be an updraft velocity. The key thing is this, you generate equations for each subdomain over which you av average, and these can be plumes, updrafts, downdrafts, and there's one distinguished subdomain, which for us is we index by, by zero, I equal zero, um, that we call the environment, and you know, that whole terminology comes from Arakawa and Schubert, that's how you guys talked about it at the time, and we still talk about it in those terms. So there's a turbulent environment that interacts with the coherent structures, with the plumes. So the equations you get are looking like this. On the left-hand side, um, AI is the area fraction, that was sigma I and Nara Kavar Schubert. The one thing that's different to how, how the equations are written in Nara Kavar Schubert is that these horizontal terms, they are still there. You're just average over everything, so there is advection of things like area fraction, updrafts and the like in the horizontal, in the vertical by the grid mean and the like. So the angle brackets indicate the, the grid mean. Um, if you do this, then in some ways the parentization becomes part of what you'd usually call the dichor, right? So these, the left-hand sides here are equations that you would solve with everything else in the dichor, is prognostic equations. They have memory, that's the prognostic terms, the, for example, memory in, in the area fraction. And you solve that in the same way you solve any other dichor equation. Um, and importantly, things like the area fraction or any other property of the convection is advected along with the flow, with the resolved flow. So the left-hand side is, is a result of rigorous homogenization averaging. There is no approximation except that we right now um, essentially make the boundary layer approximation that we, that we say in the updrafts, the vertical scales, the variations in the vertical are much larger than the variations in the horizontal. That's the only approximation in this. On the right-hand side, you get all these terms that are what now is the parentization, if you wish. Um, that's, crucially, it's entrainment, detrainment, uh, describing mass exchange or tracer exchange between different plumes, updrafts, and environments, and the like. And then there are trouble and transport terms arising like there, which you can close diffusively, and that's what this eddy diffusion mass flux approach does. So importantly, this has very much a structure that Maury Tsonsik formalism suggests that prioritization should have. There's memory. Well, there should be noise somewhere that can be on the right-hand side. And um, I think Hakon, the student who was here, he's, he's working on that, having stochastic closures on the right-hand side. Um, what I'll show you has no noise right now. I, I think it's crucial, but what I'll show you doesn't have that yet. But it does have the memory, and I'll show you why that matters. And everything on the right-hand side involves um, things we don't know a whole lot about. Ignacio yesterday talked about the turbulent transport closure, and it's, it's yet another example of what Ignacio had been doing there that 
that really impressed me. It's just taking the equations and balance laws very seriously to derive, essentially derive mixing length formulations, a whole zoo of them, and then in the end combine them. And that was really important for the results I'll show. And it just came from theory, not from, you know, not from machine learning or anything else. And it was extremely successful, extremely generalizable. We ended up with mixing length formulations that have essentially no free parameter. You can fit one parameter, but uh, not even that parameter is terribly important. But some of these things, entrainment, detrainment, are, are really great targets for machine learning. So if you think about Moni Nobokov, and um, maybe we should talk about it. How Moni Nobokov worked is you, you also just try to reduce the problem as far as you can, make this boundary layer approximation that we're making, uh, variations in the vertical are larger than the horizontal, and then ask what non-dimensional groups are in this problem. And in, in the uh, Moni Nobokov, case, there was just one non-dimensional group arising. And then you say, well, everything else, structure of velocity profiles and the like, is just a function of that non-dimensional group, you know, height divided by Obokov length in that case. So here we are talking about clouds, turbulence, convection, all in one. And well, we don't know all the non-dimensional groups, perhaps. We came up with six that, so if you don't involve higher order derivatives, you come up with six groups that can matter here. And this is some, some of what they look like. So there's something like um, z times buoyancy divided by a measure of turbulent kinetic energy in the vertical is one group that comes out. And this relative humidity comes up naturally, obviously, right? The relative humidity difference between an updraft and environment is an undimensional measure. And we have four others that look like that. Some look a bit complicated. The point is things like entrainment and detrainment become hopefully universal functions of these non-dimensional groups. And you need to introduce a scale, a dimensional scale, so the fractional entrainment, detrainment, or one over length, so there is some length scale. You can pick whatever length scale you want in principle, one over z or anything else. All it does, it will change the functional form of f if you do that, but in principle, if you have picked the right groups with any scale you choose, you should get the right function to the extent there is such a universal function. Um, Importantly, I would say this, uh, this arises in, um, through homogenization, entrainment, detrainment. Some might say, well, and I think Dave was saying that you want to use things you can measure. And in principle, you can measure entrainment and detrainment. In practice, it's really hard, even in simulations. I think being able to measure that is not as crucial. It's a bit like if you think in... Um, you know, in quantum field theories, uh, the, when you renormalize, you end up with renormalized quantities. And, and people have this slightly sexist language they use there, the bare quantities and the dressed quantities and the like. Um, the, the bare quantities, you, you cannot measure. What you can measure are things that are renormalized. And it's a bit like that here, that entrainment, detrainment, in theory, it's, it's a concept, we can describe what it is, it's hard to measure in, in practice. And I think it's not crucial that you can measure this directly, and I'll show you why not. Um, you know, I started working in this area around the time of this Arakawa and Wu paper, and to me, I'd been thinking about these issues and, and talking with Jao, especially about how to come up with parentizations that are better suited for the gray zone for deep convection. And here, here comes out this paper, Arakawa and Wu, and I find it hugely inspiring, I think in good part because I mean, Arakawa was relatively old at that point, and he was the one innovating and leading the field in innovation, saying, well, here is, here is what we need to do now, or what we did there, what we did there uh, you know, 40 years earlier was, was all good, but it doesn't fit anymore with the computing power we have, the data we have. I, I find it really inspiring. Um, what we do here is a bit different. The, this paper was concerned with jettisoning the approximation of small area fractions and updrafts. Um, we are not making that approximation, but there's also memory terms and a few other approximations that you can give, give, up, give up with. But you can ask, I think, why, why did Arakawa come up with this late in his life? And I think it's, I think it's the 150 equations. I mean, he went th carefully through a set of successive approximations. And later on, people just took the end result and put it in a model and forgot about the 150 equations or 149 before. 
Um, and I think because you guys went through this carefully, there was a sense of where did we approximate and what did we approximate that, that was deeply ingrained that I think many other people later perhaps didn't have. And, and it's, it's important to have that, that sense of success, successively approximating um, phenomena. I don't know if that's the reason, but that's how it seemed to me, that there was just an awareness of what approximations were made that, that just users who used this as models perhaps didn't have to the same degree because it took a year to get through it, and it makes it more memorable. <laughs> um, so you get consistent approximations through this coarse graining approach that I described. What you get are models that are sparse, interpretable. There's just a few functions that we don't know what they are, like entrainment, detrainment. From the outset, they conserve mass, momentum, energy. Uh, regarding John Thuburn's talk, energy problems and climate models, we are trying to we're trying to circumvent that problem from the outset by building models that exactly conserve energy by using energy, total energy actually, as a prognostic variable, both in prioritizations and the die core and the like. So you're guaranteed energy conservation. You still need to worry about the discretization, but as long as everything stays consistent in this framework, energy will be conserved, exactly. And you get physically consistent interaction among processes. You can't always do this, take this approach, but I think it works more often than people think. So for example, one thing I'm not talking about, working on land models, um, hydraulics of plants. Uh, hydraulics are obeying Newton's laws. You can use very much similar approaches that turn out to be quite successful in uh, getting it at vapor transpiration, for example. This gives you equations for all the dynamics of convection, turbulence, clouds, and you can use it for anything, not some deep convection, shallow convection, boundary layer turbulence, it works for everything. And you need to couple it to, um, to saying what clouds do. And the way we are doing this is taking ideas from Samaria and Deerdorf. Um, we carry along distributions of subgrid scale quantities, so variances, covariances of thermodynamic variables. Once you have these distributions, you can ask what fraction of our subgrid scale distribution is above saturation. That needs to be uh, in a condensed phase and the like. And you can get things like cloud cover and cloud liquid water out of that. There is one more thing that we're starting to do that I think is in the same way relaxing equilibrium assumptions. So here we have relaxed quasi-equilibrium assumptions. But there's also thermodynamic equilibrium baked into parentizations. And in thermodynamic equilibrium, you do not have supercooled liquid. And in reality, we do have supercooled liquid. Um, so thermodynamic equilibrium is also something that you don't want to bake in. And I don't want to talk about it in the interest of time, but just want to say you can re relax thermodynamic equilibrium assumptions by, um, by using assumptions of how phases relax towards equilibrium. And what that gives you is if you have a rapid updraft in, in a deep convective cloud, you, the, the condensate may not freeze at the freezing level if the updraft is rapid enough. It takes some time to freeze, and if it's rapid enough, it won't. Um, and you can get super cool cloud out of it in a physically consistent way, um, get the asymmetry between updrafts and downdrafts and the like. Um, Ignacio talked a little bit about <clears throat> what we are doing next, and Jawi is here, Jawi Shen had a poster. So there are these functions that we don't know what they are, entrainment, detrainment, chief among them, plus a few others. Um, here is just the bias in cloud cover from one climate model, and it's pretty common for climate models. You have something like 50% or higher biases in stratocumulus region, large biases in, um, in polar regions, this is just a bias and percent red means it's underestimation of cloud cover. And we just focused on regions, for example, in the tropical Pacific with large biases. And I think Ignacio already talked about some polar examples that I won't re repeat. What we did there is just generate training data, um, essentially use large eddy simulations, drive them with GCM output from just a few GCMs from the uh, IPCC archive, from CIM archive. And Jawi generated something like 500 or so of these simulations by now in different locations at different times of year. And then I think what has been hugely important and helpful for us is generate an automated process where we have this large library of hundreds of LES right now. We have the physics-based parameterization and 
Whenever you change something in that parentization, you can automatically test it against that library of simulations and see if it makes things better or worse over a pretty large sample, sampling different conditions. And you can automate it um, and use machine learning tools in ways I'll just describe in a second to learn about the functions that we don't know what they are. So I, I showed these supervised learning approaches and what, what we do differs from that in the following way. In climate, what matters are statistics, so averages, second moments, higher moments, extremes, and the like. And what matters are not tendencies or the next day. Um, the tendencies might be a crutch to get there. The problem with learning from tendencies is that not just that interpretation and the like is hard, it's also once you have a model that captures the tendencies very well, you put it in the GCM, it tends to be unstable. There is no guarantee that if your tendencies are well captured, that you have uh, something that leads to a stable simulation, and often it doesn't. So we focus on climate statistics and learn from climate statistics, both from these large eddy simulations and soon from observations as well. And that means in large eddy simulations we take things like the liquid water path, the time average profiles of specific humidity, temperature, second moments of various quantities, but time average quantities is a key and use those to learn about the unknown functions, the, the equivalent of the Mooney and Obukov similarity functions, entrainment and detrainment, as a function of the non-dimensional groups that we decided ahead of time what they are. These statistics can include any statistic. It can, can include a measure of extreme precipitation, covariance between SST and cloud cover, an emergent constraint, if you wish, of, um, of cloud changes. Um, you can build this into the learning process. I think it's a good way of using emergent constraints as building them in into the learning process. And then we do want to use machine learning. We, we want to use the expressive models that are around, but do that in an inverse problem setting, which means there is some function, epsilon delta, deep inside the convection scheme that's built into a, a larger model. The larger model produces output of statistics, and we can use the mismatch between these statistics that are simulated and observed or generated in LES to learn about those functions in an inverse problem setting, not having input-output pairs. Say, input to detrainment would be the state of a column, output would be entrainment-detrainment, but again, you cannot measure that in observations, and it's even really, really hard to get out of simulations. So we're not trying to do that, the supervised learning of entrainment-detrainment. Rather, learn about those functions in an inverse problem setting, where the data we have are indirect, like cloud cover as depends on entrainment, but it's not directly a measure of entrainment. It creates some challenges. It throws away some information. Um, obviously, as to average, you always lose some information. Evaluation of the loss function in climate model is expensive, and we have found ways of getting around that, speeding up the process of Bayesian learning here that I won't talk about. The, the crux of the matter is you can speed up Bayesian learning by something like a factor of 1,000 by combining ideas from common inversion with ideas from machine learning, and that makes this feasible even in a climate model. What I'll show you is just a single color model for now. So you don't have input-output pairs, and you don't generally have gradients of the functions you want to minimize here. We have uh, tried as hard as we can to eliminate all the things that end up being non-differentiable in parentizations, you know, funny clippings and the like. We are not totally free of those things. But there remain non-differential aspects in phase transitions, for example. So we use ensemble common methods, which are gradient-free methods, um, coming from common filtering used in weather forecasting, just used in a smoothing and inversion setting, to learn about these closure, closure functions. And here, we came up with guesses of closure functions that made some physical sense. I don't think I necessarily trust the physical structure a great deal. I mean, some of them make sense, but it's not the first principle derivation the way the uh, averaging is. But it actually works quite well. We have, in this case, there's a, about a dozen parameters in these functions we can estimate. And on the left is the mean squared error on this training sample of hundreds of large eddy simulations. And then we did large eddy simulations in increasing the surface temperature by 4 Kelvin to so get an out-of-sample validation test that we don't use in training. And the key thing is that as you iterate over these common inversions, some mini-batching over epochs, on the left, the error decreases 
different common inversion methods, different types of mini batching don't need to go into what it is. Decreases approximately monotonically, there's noise from batching. And the important part is on the right is the validation error. So here is a, a sample that was not seen during training. And these methods validate extremely well. The validation error decreases monotonically. So it generalizes out of the sample, I think because the physics is rigorous and works in non-dimensional quantities. I mean, just in the same way that Moni Novikov similarity generalizes from Kansas wheat fields to just about everything else. Um, you have the same type of generalizability here. And what a few people, Costa, I don't know if he's here, was here yesterday, Ignacio and a few others are doing, is replace these functions with neural networks, random feature models, free neural operators. We have a whole zoo and by automating this training pipeline, there's the data and we run the single column models, you can very quickly experiment uh, putting in neural networks and see what that makes better or worse. Neural networks make things slightly better but not much, which is uh, Again, I think a nice illustration of the power of theory here. I mean, as long as, as the physical framework is good, it's hard to go very wrong, is what we have learned. But it's very easy to go wrong if, if you throw the physics overboard. Um, just some examples. So here is in blue is a large eddy simulation of a stratocumulus situation. Um, this is off the coast of California. In gray, this is just, again, driving a large eddy simulation with output from a GCM. Gray as a GCM, I think this, uh, it doesn't matter which GCM it is, but it's pretty typical. This cloud cover is underestimated by something like a factor of two. Um, the LES gets a cloud cover of about 100%, and this uh, new EDMF type model gets the cloud cover just about right. Um, has 100% cloud cover and overall the right structure. And the um, the fun thing is you can keep doing that in all sorts of regimes. Ignacio showed some yesterday for stable boundary layers. It's, it's all the same models and all sorts of different regimes with the same parameters that gives you the right dynamics. This is another stratocumulus case uh, from the DICOMS field campaign. Here we have aircraft observations, um, the single column model and the dashed line. It needs resolution that's relatively high in the lower part of the atmosphere. In this case, it's 20 meters. Or somewhere between 20 and 50 meters is what you need and you can get stratocumulus cloud cover as well as the LES. In fact, better than many LES. Um, LES, the cloud cover is pretty sensitive to numerics, and this is less sensitive to numerics. Um, of course, it's much faster than, than any direct simulation. It's you know, what you need for prioritization. It's a bit more complicated to implement in the, in the dynamical core because it has these di diagnostic term, the prognostic terms. Um, it leads to some challenges we're still working through with implicit time stepping for everything and the like. That's, that's a bit tedious to make it computationally fast. Just one other example from this. Here is a deep convection over the Amazon. And you see on the right is the vertical velocity. Um, on the left is cloud condensate and the middle precipitation coming up soon. This is from, um, from one of the ARM sites. I didn't put the observations on it because it gets kind of messy. The, the main point I just want to make it starts looping through. This is a diurnal cycle of deep convection, and it has a smooth evolution from boundary layer turbulence, shallow convection, deep convection. There's no switches, triggers, any such things. It just, you know, it starts from boundary layer turbulence. You start forming a low cloud, gradually rises up. It hits the freezing level. You make ice. Some rain sets in. And it's just one prioritization, in this case, just with a dozen parameters and no more for all of it. So no switching from turbulence to shallow to deep convection or any such thing. And it's, the diurnal cycle is, um, in a simulation, captures the observed diurnal cycle very well. I think Ignacio showed that yesterday as well. So I think the most fun part about working on this was that we started with these guesses for entrainment, detrainment that I didn't have great confidence in, but I had confidence in the series of approximations on the physical system. And we started, you know, the first few papers we wrote um, were just on a handful of case studies, as t is typically the case with these parentizations. And I was nervous that once we look at more data, you know, this will not work anymore. You're overfitting what we had. And, and we didn't. I mean, it, it keeps being quite accurate for whatever new data we are looking at. I think it's the, 
maybe the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and the natural sciences that, that comes to the fore here and we shouldn't forget about. The memory terms are crucial for this. So you wouldn't get the smooth evolution like that without having a memory in, on the subgrid scale. So next step for us is integrate this in the GCM and a few of us are working feverishly to make this happen. Hopefully in a few weeks we'll have that and then that we can learn from observations in much the same way as we have from the high resolution simulations. There's no fundamental difference because we focus on the statistics that are available observationally and, and from LES. We're using the same approach, um, this CLIMA project, for all components of an all newer system model. I think they're saying it's probably the only climate modeling project at a university anywhere in the world. Um, it is all new. You know, you can question whether all new is necessary. I think for a DICOR it wouldn't necessarily be necessary to do it. It gives you some advantages in new software that exploits um, accelerator architecture as well and the like. You could do a bunch of these things, say, with NCESM in just the same way. Um, it's a group working on the oceans at MIT, the land biosphere. That has been fun for me to learn a bit about, that the same focus on theory actually gets you quite far. It gets you to much simpler models that than are currently used that are still more predictive. And I think this, this tripod here is key to progress. Nader Giovanni and Rob Sokolo and I wrote a, whatever you call it, an essay or something in Physics Today last year that was outlaying, laying out this approach. And I think it's very much the approach that Arakawa was taking all along. You just are really careful with the theory, course grain equations, um, use the data you have to inform what's left there. And in the 70s, that was little data, little data computationally and much less uh, observationally. But now we have much more data that we can use to learn about closure functions like here, symbolically Reynolds stresses appearing in obvious Stokes equation. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I think the, as I said in the beginning, to me, Arakawa's approach to science is exemplary for what's crucial for progress in climate science and modeling. And the patience he had in deriving things and keeping at it until you got the solution, I think is really important. And it's something that, that um, well, at, at least I, I would want my students to take from science as well. Um, it's, it is a, incentives in science today are not fostering this very well, right? There's this rapid publication and the like. But, but I think it's really essential for sustainable progress. And what could be more sustainable than ideas you, you have developed still being in active use 50 years later. Theory remain, remains essential and the job of theory is to provide sparsely parameterized, generalizable models we can interpret, things we can understand. Here in the case of modeling, but the you know, same goes for general circulation where the focus would be just really on understanding things. And I think the, the way to use data is to treat machine learning as an inverse problem, combine it with theory. So learn within physical structures um, about functions you don't know very much like what we do in, in Moni and Obukov similarity theory. Computational capabilities you can use in various ways, get the highest resolution you can, but also I think a good use is generate big libraries of training data for whatever you can simulate explicitly, ocean turbulence, cloud turbulence, and the like. And then I showed you some examples from these sparsely parameterized and physics-based models that can capture turbulence and cloud regimes that have vexed climate models for decades. And I'll leave it right here, and thanks for listening. I mean, the last point is crucial, right? I mean, there, as soon as you make any physical parameter dependent on space, you haven't done your job of physical modeling, right? The gravitational constant is not dependent whether you're on Mars or on Earth. So that's, you start with this promise. There's nothing, premise, there's nothing dependent on space or time explicitly in the parameters. <clears throat> and yes, you do get distributions on the parameters from which you can sample after the fact to get predictions with quantified uncertainties. There's a lot more going into it. There, you get distributions. You're starting to include um, structural error models. Well, I think these equations are good. They're not without approximation. You want to 
quantify the approximation error in that as well, and you can do it in much the same way I, I outlined here. Um, so yes, distributions are essential, and after the fact you sample from them. And didn't show an example, but you can get climate predictions that sample that posterior density over model uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's clear that his theoretical work is in, inspired by observations, right? By very diligent observations. I, re I remember Akio saying the only difference between his approach and Yanai was Yanai knew what the time derivatives were. <laughs> <laughs> Subdomains, some of which might behave like an environment some of the time, without uh, specifically designating one as a yeah. special environment. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I think the what I didn't say is what is what made the environment special for us. I mean, it was really just a way of cutting down the number of equations to deal with. So the in the EDMF approach, as Zhao and Pierre, she was my folks were pioneering, the key thing is that there are fluctuations in the environment, but not in the updrafts. Updrafts are top hats, right? And we are making the same approximation here. You don't have to do that. You can carry the fluctuations in the updrafts as well. So maybe the, the way I would phrase your comment is there's, there's no assumptions about air refraction or anything else in the environment here, right? So maybe the way to look at it is saying maybe you shouldn't treat your updrafts and downdrafts in a top hat fashion but carry fluctuations in them as well and then they look exactly like the environment. And you could do it. You know, we carry second order equations in the environment. You would have to carry second order equations in the updrafts and downdrafts. It's just more equations and uh, you know, definitely doable. Absolutely, right? It's just a, it's the usual trade-off between computational cost and accuracy and um, we have done extremely well with accuracy so far and it's easy enough to change the approximation when we need to because again we know where we made the approximations. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, well, there is there's ever so slight overlap, you see. It's just very little in this case. Um, the this particular simulation, it doesn't have this non-equilibrium thermodynamics that I was mentioning either. But the, so it's, it's, this is doing what is typically done in climate models, that you just make the partitioning between liquid and ice a function of temperature. So all ice is below homogeneous freezing and all liquid above, uh, above, um, above the freezing temperature, which is physically not right because it treats something as an equilibrium process that's not. But that's what it's doing and that gives you a little bit of overlap. I mean, the, you know, the prioritization problem in weather forecasting models, climate models, is more or less the same. The difference is that if you don't get shallow clouds or the Pacific right in the weather forecasting model, your data simulation corrects for the error that you would be making if, if you make this free running. I mean, my hope would be that these ideas first, they arose at, arose at ECMWF with John Pierce and folks for weather forecasting models. My hope would be that you can use the exact same approach in a weather forecasting model. And one thing we'll have to do once this works in a global model is to see to what degree you get grid convergence and to what degree is a 50 kilometer simulation as good as 10, as five kilometers and see whether it breaks down. I think if you can make this scale of resolution independent, that you have some degree of grid convergence and you could use it even in a high resolution weather forecasting model. A crucial thing is that the only approximation really baked in this is um, assuming that vertical variations are large compared with horizontal. You know, at some scale that will break down as you get to very high resolution. But before you get there, in principle this should work. Now in practice we don't know yet and we'll have to see. <laughs>